All right, welcome to the cancer video where we talk about something that I am very passionate about. And I have been working with this myself personally since 2018. And I talk about it with my patients every day um, and get asked all sorts of questions about it. And now it is trendy. So we're gonna break this down a little bit more. Um, and this is the concept of cold exposure or cold therapy or cold water dipping, whatever you will. Um, it is very common in kind of the big population, but we wanna talk about it today specifically in the world of cancer for cancer patients. So this is a rehab tool I have highlighted a lot in my blogs, particularly the blog on chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathies, as well as the blog on managing hormone therapy in breast cancer. So we really wanna go into detail here in the separate video to give you the kind of tools and overview that you need to do this safely and effectively. So here we are talking about deliberate cold submersion when we talk about cold exposure. So this involves a lot more than just cooling down the glabrous tissue, as I've talked about in other blog posts about cooling the palms or the forehead or the feet. We're talking about a little bit more here. We're talking about cold exposure. We're aiming to be affected by the neck down and we're aiming to expose the body to a cold experience. And that cold experience should be slightly uncomfortable, but safe. Um, so for, for definition's sake, a lot of the literature has really looked at cold immersion, which means either kind of being submerged in water neck deep in an ocean, a lake, or a bath. The literature has not looked at cold showers or cryotherapy equipment. Um, it really looked at something where it can control the variable such that all of your skin surface area is being affected. For accessibility's sake, for simplicity's sake, for allowing you know, cancer patients to be able to do what works for them and what's easy, I have included all forms of cold exposure, including cryotherapy equipment, including a cold shower, and so on. I've also said that patients could maybe start by wearing gloves or booties um, if that is more comfortable for them because I'm very passionate about making this not just as prescribed, but making this safe and effective for everyone to get there slowly. So we're including all types of cold exposure. But what we've come to understand is that cold exposure may help with pain, fatigue, and increase mental well-being. These are symptoms I've talked about with hormone therapy where breast cancer patients can feel flatlined, they can have pain, they can feel nauseous. Patients with chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathies can have foot and hand pain and neuralgias of all sorts. So we really um, talk a lot about this tool for some of those related conditions. So how to get started safely. That is something I'm excited about and I wanna break um, down today. Um, and I talk about this a lot with patients because some of the patients will come in and they'll say, I jumped off the dock today, it was terrible, I raced out in panic and I'll never do it again. <laughs> well, that isn't effective <laughs> or something that I'd love for you to do. So we really wanna talk about how to do this slowly and adapt your body to the cold shock. So the very first thing that I always talk about is practice your breathing right from the start. Your aim is to slow your breathing down and to not hold your breath. So that is the first thing that we're trying to do. The second thing is some patients can start with cooler temperatures as opposed to colder temperatures and just be in there a little bit longer. Um, the other option or strategy would be to enter in the cold water slowly. So you walk in and you're kind of at your hips for two, three minutes adjusting before you then kind of push off and get your torso submerged. So these are a few strategies that can kind of help you do this slowly. I also recommend that patients kind of do this over a two to three week span where they are slowly edging into slightly colder temperatures or edging into more submersion, but they are not just doing this kind of right off the bat. I think it's really important to train yourself to control your breathing before the experience starts so that by the time you're in the water or you're experiencing the cold shock or the cooler shock, that you aren't holding your breath and that you're able to slow down your breathing. So that is a really great way to do it safely and effectively. So once again, slow down your breathing rate and don't hold your breath. So as you kind of focusing on slowing down your breathing rate, okay, what does that mean? Well, uh, James Nestor kind of talks about it in his book, Breath, as uh, coherent breathing. And I kind of like this idea. It's a very specific five and a half seconds in and out. A lot of cultures all throughout time have kind of practiced this rough number, which is really cool and kind of fascinating. It's very specific. Don't worry too much about that. The goal is just to slow down your breathing. 
inhale kind of through the nose and out through the mouth if you like, kind of slowing that down. Once you feel a little bit of that cold shock and your desire is to kind of spasm and stop breathing, focus on just having a slightly longer exhale. And when you have a slightly longer exhale, your body will naturally start to slow your entire breathing rate down. So that's a good hack. If you just can't think much due to the uh, discomfort, just focus on the exhale being a little bit longer. And through that, you will naturally slow down your breathing rate. The goal, of course, like I said, is to kind of do enough practice such that when you start to feel the cold shock or the discomfort, that you're in a state where you are aware and you can very much control your breathing all throughout. So we also really highlighted the kind of, you know, experience of it as kind of trusting the process because the discomfort will pass, which is a really interesting aspect of cold exposure. Your body will notice this, maybe find it threatening, therefore produce a feeling of maybe some pain or discomfort as the alarm system goes off. But then after a while, your brain, also because of your deep breathing, will start to notice this isn't a threat and the pain might start to settle, or the discomfort starts to settle, or the panic starts to settle. And our goal is to try to enter in in a slight state of calm. The goal is also to exit in a slight state of calm. So just to put into detail, this is the kind of cold exposure protocol that I've highlighted for those with cancer who want to explore cold exposure safely. So when possible, we talked about cold exposure kind of being from the neck down. We define cold exposure as any type cold shower, lake, ocean, cooler bath, ice bath, cryotherapy, whatever you have access to. The, the research really highlights 11 minutes total per week, very random number. You don't necessarily have to abide by that, but kind of roughly think about that number. Maybe you have a few short two minute exposures in the week. Maybe you only do one or two, five to six minute kind of exposures, totaling roughly to 10, 11 minutes per week. The research then shows that there's some really cool effects when we hit that number. The third point of the protocol is that the temperature should be uncomfortably cold such that you'd like to escape it. It shouldn't just be like, oh, that's cool. It should feel like, whoa, I feel that. I don't love it. I have a bit of a state of wanting to flee. But we did really highlight above that you do want to get there slowly and safely. So maybe you start with some cooler temperatures over a three week period to kind of adjust your body and understand what that feeling is like of that panic and that flea so that you've practiced slowing down your breathing and you don't hold your breath. So the exciting stuff is that the research shows that repeated cold exposure over long periods of time. So if you've been doing this 10, 11 minutes a week for a couple of months, that it actually may have an anti-inflammatory effect. It can affect levels of interleukin-6, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. We start to see changes there, which is really cool. So that generally can lead to a reduction in chronic inflammation and pain. Repeated cold exposure also supports this boost in dopamine and anyone who's done it will tell you how good they feel. And we know that dopamine is a motivational hormone and it just generally helps us to feel good. So this can be so, so, so helpful in a cancer journey when things like hormone therapy are decreasing our level of, you know, um, inflammation, anti-inflammatory ability in the body and hormone therapy is kind of causing patients to feel a bit flatlined or fatigued or nauseous or, or chemotherapy induced neuropathies are causing a lot of pain in the feet and in the hands um, or just cancer related pain in general, cancer related fatigue in general. These are all conditions with which repeated or long um, sustained cold exposure over time can help feel a little bit better, um, have a bit more energy, have a little bit less pain. So I'm really curious about this tool and I've been really passionate about it for a few years um, and I've been seeing really neat things in my own personal journey with it and I've been hearing really positive things from patients as well. So thank you today for letting me break down the cold exposure protocol in more detail and as always thank you for your interest in science and rehab.